Hello, beautiful souls. Welcome back for another empowering episode of the Elevate series. I am so excited about the women in attendance who have been giving us so much feedback about how the strategies and practices have really transformed their lives. And in today's conversation, we're going to be talking about something I think a lot of women need. I have had some beautiful personal conversations with my special guest today, Nancy, and we're going to be talking today about perfectionism and how to gently overcome perfectionism. And you'll know more about what a, what that phrase means when you get to um, hear Nancy's wisdom. So sacred embodiment coach, intuitive healer, and author Nancy Reed supports successful, empathic, and mission-driven women to embrace their perfectly imperfect self. I love that phrase. With curiosity and gentleness, so they learn to trust the wisdom of their soul, live from their dreams, not their perceived limitations, and live their happily ever now, not after everything else is perfect. Yeah. Know that feeling. Nancy supports women to gently elevate their self-healing with her happily ever living process, which is a signature approach to empower self-healing within her clients via practical spirituality and sacred embodiment practices. Welcome, my friend. Hi, it's so lovely to be here. Well, you know, uh, it's so funny, like, ladies, I just got to tell you something. Sometimes the divine brings someone into your life. We had an instant connection. We've gotten to know each other over the few next the last few months. And I said, oh, I have got to get this. I need Nancy's wisdom in the Elevate Summit. So <laughs> for stepping in. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, thank you so much. I felt that same connection right away. And there are those moments where we connect with people and it feels like we've known them for lifetimes. Yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly how it felt. And, <laughs> and one of the reasons to not only the person, was I drawn to the person you are, your heart and how you live your life, I was really drawn, once, especially once I read your book, um, <laughs> to your journey towards your core message, which is about gently overcoming perfectionism. So mm -hmm. let's talk about that, because some people would say, oh, my God, overcoming perfectionism would be too much work. This is who I am. This is who I've always been. What do you say to that? What I say is that you don't have to give up any part of yourself and you don't have to go to war with that inner perfectionist, like I like to say, that has been living with you and from its place, it believes that it's serving a purpose. It believes that it is protecting you from ever quote unquote failing or from ever having mistakes or God forbid, you know, some sort of reframe or redo, right? That's, that's what the perfectionist is coming from. So if you can have compassion for that voice rather than judgment, that actually allows you to tune into your inner voice instead. I love this. And I love your phrase about gentleness, gentleness and non-judgment. And I know your backstory and um, how this was the exact opposite of how you used to feel for <laughs> years. And yeah. I've always said our message is our message, but your story really um, touched me and inspired me because you don't just teach these principles. You had to do the deep dive into them integrate them and you've been living from them so you know firsthand the journey the experience and it was it your experience that led you to the two the two of your most important principles you have many but two is gentleness and no self-judgment so talk about those two elements and why they really sabotage so many of us from our own happiness of being here in this moment well, what happens is that when we have self-judgment, we're also entering into a place of comparison. And so whenever we go into a mindset that's being led by a lens of comparison, we're not being present. So that's the first part of it, is that there's an acknowledgement that comes. And certainly in my own journey, that's what I realized was that either I was looking back on my past with shame or blame or even just wanting to annihilate it, you know, create a curated version of myself. 
so that I wouldn't be judged as harshly by others as I was judging myself. And we always judge ourselves the hardest, right? So, so that's the first thing is to recognize that nobody is thinking about those things that we all have from our stories with the same level of preconceived judgments that we are ourselves. So when you recognize that, then it's like, okay, so if I'm getting a mileage out of something from my past, then what is that really doing? Well, it's keeping you from being where you are now. And also it's keeping you limited to what you're allowing to even come into as a potential experience for your future. So either one of them comes from a mindset of limitations. And what I found is that instead, if you come from a mindset that's led by a lens of love, rather than those limitations, that things really shift. And that all comes from getting there to be a conversation between yourself and your inner voice that is amplified more than the one between you and your inner perfectionist. You know, and I just love the phrase inner perfectionist because the moment I hear it, and maybe because I'm visual and words are important to me, um, when I hear it, I immediately know what voice you're talking about (laughs) we we all have it (laughs) we all do and and again it's like if if you you know it, it doesn't take a lot of effort it doesn't take actually a lot of skill to be harsh with ourselves that's something unfortunately that is pretty simple to do and pretty easy for our mindset to want to be led by judgment because going into comparisons again keeps us from being present it really takes a choice and a presence in the present to go okay so how can i look at this from a different place how can i acknowledge all of my story without denying any part of it yet not feel the shame, the blame, and the comparison, and really that judgment and fear and guilt that comes along with anything that we would maybe want to hit the edit button from our past, right? And we all have those things. And so if you can come from that place of compassion, if you can come from assuming the best, that even your inner perfectionist had the best intentions with what it was that it was trying to lead you to do, then you're actually aligning with a totally different voice, which is that inner voice, which is the truth of you. And when you become comfortable with knowing the truth of you, then you're able to recognize, as I say from A Course in Miracles, which is the spiritual thought system that I study, that says, in my defenselessness, my safety lies as one of its workbook lessons. And so there's something really powerful that comes from knowing what's true for you rather than feeling you need to defend, explain, or apologize. And when you're able to do that with yourself, then you're able to transform and shift all of your relationships because we can't share what we don't already have. And so if we haven't experienced that self-compassion, that self-love, that kindness and curiosity, like I talk about with myself, with our own stories, How can we possibly share and extend and expand that into all of our other relationships? We can't. No, it's not possible. What we can't give ourselves and what we can't experience for ourselves, we can't radiate outward, right? Exactly. So so beautiful. And there's another phrase you use that um, perfectly imperfect self, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, I usually use the word like divinely imperfect. Like I tell my clients, Mm. divinely imperfect action. Stop, wait, it's different. It's in business that I'm using it in that context. But we wait to do things in business or in life Mm -hmm. until we can see the full map ahead of us and know everything's going to work out. Mm -hmm. And when I hear the words perfectly imperfect self, it reminds me like be gentle with myself. When When I have these expectations for a child, when I have these expectations, if my best friend came to me with these same thoughts and go, I wouldn't say these things that I'm saying to myself. So what, what part of your journey did that come up for you about this perfectly imperfect self? Because it's just so beautiful. Well, what I realized was that I was spending so much of my time on trying to be perfect. And then I really had to look at well, what was the purpose 
of that perfectionism, right? Because it's like that question of what is this for? And a lot of people say, know your why in life. And I, I definitely have seen the power in that. But for me, the word why is associated with a level of judgment, right? That there's some sort of defense immediately. So when we ask somebody or like our small children or something, if we say, well, why did you do that? Yes, we want to know, but we've also assumed that there's some sort of thing that they need to explain or that somehow it comes into a defensive sort of posture, even if that's not our intention. So I've shifted that in my own language with myself and language can be so powerful in how our lenses and our mindset is shaped, right? And so instead of saying, well, why did you do it that way, Nancy? Or why? I say, what was the purpose in that? What was the, what was that serving, you know, coming from a place of curiosity rather than preconceived judgment. And then what happens is that I've noticed in my own self relationship, as well as with others, that there's so much more spaciousness in the response. There's not that knee jerk reaction and there's no defensiveness because now it's like, oh, Okay, so there's there's not anything that I need to apologize or explain or defend here. Somebody's really wanting to know what is motivating me, what is inspiring me to do this. Even if it's not something maybe that they would want to do, they're coming from a bigger place. And I'm going to feel that as a highly sensitive person. And anyone that's worked with me is also highly sensitive. <laughs> and so, you know, there's there's always that like attracts like. But I've even seen it with my own daughter that when I talk to her about something, if I go, well, why did you do that? Or, you know, why, why, why didn't you finish your homework? Or why didn't you finish your dinner or something like that? Right. There's this immediate sense of sort of those puppy dog eyes, like, oh, now I've done something wrong. Mommy's unhappy with me. Something's wrong with me. And I recognize that and go, oh, I've seen that look before in my own eyes. And I don't want anyone to feel that. And so if I look at her instead and I say, so what was it about tonight's dinner that made it hard to finish? She pauses usually and then thinks about it before she responds. I give her that space. I'm not already judging. That's something that's, you know, she's done and that I know what it is that's caused her to do something that might be something I would want done. And so I've just noticed in all of my relationships, there's that, that shift. It's almost like you're giving somebody, including yourself, an extra exhale. And so if you take that in and you go, okay, so before I respond to anyone asking me a question, instead of going into that why energy of like, oh, okay, so I need an answer. I need, an, uh, I need to explain myself. I need to defend myself. If it's a what, then it's like, oh, well, then I can take that internal inventory. I can look without judgment. I can go into that space of curiosity, but I can be led by love and by kindness and gentleness rather than judgment. And that can make a really, really, really big difference, not only in how you're relating with yourself, but then how you extend that into all of your other relationships. I could feel it in my own energy body <laughs> as you were sharing the, the difference. And it's so true that why brings us up to a sense of a shame and actually putting up a wall like, oh, I did something wrong. So thank you for sharing that. You also have some um, some parts of your philosophy that you're sharing today, which I love. And one of them, which I love because we're both word gals, <laughs> about shifting your language. So mm -hmm. what is a key part of shifting our language and why it's important? Well, so one of the things with perfectionism that I came to know is that I wasn't comfortable with saying, I know, but I was comfortable with saying, I think, because when I was saying, I think to some sort of question, let's say a well-meaning, but kind of nosy family member might've been saying back in the day, when are you two kids going to have a baby? <laughs> or, you know, when are you going to write your book? Right. Cause you've been talking about that for a while. So when are you going to write it? When are you going to publish it? If I responded using a perfectionist as my guide, then my language was something like, uh, I think 
that I, I, I might be doing that um, sometime in the future, or I, I, I think that that we are going to be looking into that, uh, you know, at a later date. And there was always this actual answering the question with a question, because when I was saying, I think there was that sort of, you know, up attend at the end of it where there was actually a question in the question so that I wasn't really giving a response. Whereas what I looked at though with that is that, okay, so again, what is this for? What is the purpose of me not standing in my knowledge of what is true for me? Because I know me just like all of us know ourselves. We do. But there's so much worry that if we're aligning with perfectionism, that if we say the wrong thing, either that we're going to be responsible for someone being unhappy with us, or that somehow we have let ourselves down because we're not giving the answer that everyone is expecting. And, you know, there's all this judgment and all this comparison and all this not being in the present. And there's also this little aspect of perfectionism that I talk about in my book too, that I feel like is not addressed enough, but something that really was a game changer for me, which is that just because I'm asking someone else for their opinion or that I am giving away my power of decision-making to someone else doesn't take me off the hook for the outcome. And in perfectionism, that is really a hard pill to swallow, but it's, it's, it's been such a, I guess I'd say a point of light for me and healing is recognizing that that was one of the purposes that I had in feeling powerless. It was to maintain and preserve my perfectionism, my decision-making. But what I realized is that actually not making a decision is a decision and that I'm not off the hook for the outcome. That's a powerful insight. I want everyone to take that in for a moment. We've all been guilty. And I'm <laughs> taking back that word. I don't even like it. We yeah. all fell into the pattern mm -hmm. of not making decisions, thinking that if I just stay status quo, everything will be fine but it keeps us in a stuck energy. So thank you for sharing that. And, and number two you are sharing is about, this is a big one, I think, especially for women. It was a really big one for my transformation. Trust in your inner voice and not the voice of the inner perfectionist. Yes, and that goes along with extending what I was just saying, that if you're shifting your language from I think, then what are you shifting it into? It's I know. And if you just pause with that for a moment, and it feels awkward at first, I totally get it. I mean, at first, when I started saying to my family members and friends and even clients and everyone that had the best of intentions, I, I totally felt that. But when I shifted from saying, I think, to I know. So when they would ask me about the book and they would say, when are you going to write it? And I would say, I know that when the time is most aligned, the book will be written. I know, right, exactly. I know that when our family together as a husband and wife are grounded, we will be opening our hearts to the idea of having a child, right? There's, there's a real difference. You're no longer asking for permission for having your thought. You're no longer answering a question with a question. And instead, you're coming from that exhale. You're coming from that purposeful pause. You speak even more with a different cadence, I've noticed too. You know, that when you're saying, I think there's like this, this energy that's almost like frenetic sort of anxiety underneath the tone. But when you say, I know, you're dropping in. You're totally present. And when you say that, whoever it is that asked you a question is so much less likely to somehow put you on, a, a, you know, needing to defend your response. My experience is that when I say, I know that X, Y, or Z is true for me, or I know this is how it's unfolding, people go, oh, okay. And then they just go on. 
And there's no more of that defensive wall. There's no more of that shame and blame and hiding and feeling like you want to be invisible. I used to wish when I was a little girl that if I could have a superpower, it would be invisibility because I thought that then nobody would ever find anything wrong with me. I couldn't possibly get in trouble. I couldn't possibly not measure up if nobody even knew I was there, <laughs> but I could be living my life. I could, I could be following my heart. I could be trusting my intuitions on things, but totally free from judgment. And so now that's what's really shifted for me is that I've gone from thinking that I can only do that by being invisible to embracing this perfectly imperfect self that is me which means that perfectionism is not cured by any means. There are still things that trigger me. There are still experiences, especially people that have more letters after their name. That's definitely been a big one for me or really strong domineering men. That was another one, a bigger classroom. And so when those things come up though, and they do, I look at it differently. Once I let myself have all the feelings and maybe be triggered and maybe go down the exact same paths as I did before, I see the purpose of them differently and I go, okay, so something's still there that's unhealed and that's okay. I don't have to be perfect. This is about being perfectly imperfect. So how can I look at this decision with gentleness rather than judgment? How can I go, okay, so let's go ahead and start over here. This doesn't have to define me as a person. This doesn't have to limit my options in the future. I can still be navigating this perfect imperfection and be fully present and do the best I can and remind others that what's possible for one of us is possible for all of us. I got to tell you, this is just, we speak the same language, but you have this way of really getting underneath the layers. So I want to say thank you, thank you, because both points that you've shared, and we still have one more, and then we're going to share your free gift. But um, yeah, it's your way of describing, and you can really get down below the layers. So I just love this conversation, my friend, as I as thank always. You. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. So choosing a lens of love, um, it's something, it's how I ch choose to live my life, but I'd love your insights of what that means to you. Well, this is a really fun exercise that again, my inner perfectionist and I came up together with my inner voice, because that's just it. It's not about learning how to annihilate or go to war with that part of yourself. It's learning how to live with it, but without judgment. And so if we're not judging it, then we're not giving it power to take away our choices or to define our choices. It can still be there making all the noise in the world, right? But we don't have to give it the power to believe it. We don't have to give it the power to somehow limit what is possible for us. And so I wear contact lenses and I see you have glasses on and I can wear glasses too. So you can either take this idea between a physical contact lens or wearing glasses, either one of these. And if you don't wear those for prescription, feel free to think about it as sunglasses too, because it, it works all together. But if you think about taking a physical lens, whatever your preference is, and one of these lenses is going to be forged with the energy and the intention and the space of love, nothing else. That means that the only thing that can be perceived through that single lens is whatever reflects and demonstrates the presence of love in the present. And then the other lens is going to be the way that we always see things, right? And particularly with our little inner perfectionist helping us out. So there's going to be comparison. There's going to be shame. There's going to be blame. There's going to be looking at our past and, you know, wanting to make some kind of highlighted social media friendly version of it for ourselves and for others before we feel like we're enough, right? So that's probably the familiar one to us. And that's okay. Again, acknowledging where we are is really important here. Because if we can't look at it all, how could we possibly heal all of it, right? So, so there really is that intention of invitation with yourself as you're going through any of these exercises or any of these approaches. And so if you think about that, okay, now I've got these two different lenses. And so I have the one 
where I can only perceive through that energy and demonstration of the presence of love in the present. And then I have the other one that is also our companion that we're going to acknowledge, but maybe not give as much power to, right? It's still there. We're not going to say it's not because if we actually deny it, we'll make it bigger in its power over us because we only deny what it is we're afraid of. And if we're not willing to look, then we're actually giving it much more power and much more presence in our present. And so if you think about now taking that lens of love and you're just going to cover up the one eye and have the single eye with the lens of love and just go through your day and see what shifts. Now that you have this lens, you can even look in a mirror yourself and think about how tempting it is. And again, how easy it is to find all our flaws, to point out all the ways that we're imperfect, to find out and that that's a bad thing. And that, you know, somehow we're not measuring up. Oh, we've got these extra wrinkles here, creases here, cellulite, you know, all these other things physically. And then also emotionally, how we look at ourselves and spiritually, how we look at ourselves. Oh, I'm not as spiritual as this person because I don't meditate every day. Oh, I'm not, you know, I'm not as important as this person because I don't have letters after my name as many, you know, as, as so-and-so, any of those things. But if we're only able to perceive all of our experiences with that lens of love, just notice what happens. Notice what perceptions you actually get to keep and what sort of decisions you get to keep. And then what ones you're actually going to let go of and that don't fit anymore into your experience. Now that you've decided to choose a lens of love rather than one of judgment and fear and perfectionism. And then you can go back to that familiar eye, right? You can go back to that other side and you can look around at things because you're not afraid of it anymore, but you see the difference. And what you notice is that, wow, I can be looking at the very same thing and yet have two totally different experiences. That's the empowerment. That's the place of choice and decision. And that's what embracing the perfectly imperfect and as I like to say, living your happily ever now, not after everything else is perfect, is possible. And you can extend that into all areas of your life and also with other relationships. Ladies, I know you're all feeling this down to your soul as I am. You shared so many bits of wisdom. I love that you share from your own personal experiences. To me, um, it gives this richness to the conversation. So thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. And um, I want to invite everyone, before I tell you about the free gift, I want you to sit with this whole conversation. There was so many seeds of wisdom. And I just want you to try that exercise that she shared about the lens of love, because I thought that was powerful. And I think it's so beautiful. It's a fun thing to play with the kids, too. So thank you for that, Nancy. Thank you so I want to invite everyone right next to the video. As always, there's a little button there. I want you to click it. It will tell you all about Nancy's gift. I'm going to share it here with you also. You will get the Align with Love self-healing gift set. It's going to help you, everything we talked about today, invite more gentleness and less judgment into your daily life. In the Align with Love self-healing gift set, you'll receive the 15-minute intentionally inviting gentleness guided meditation and seven self-healing journal prompts that will really help you connect with that essence and truth within you. This set will gently stir your wonder and curiosity and align your body, mind, and spirit with love and not limitations. So again, download that free gift, stay connected with Nancy, learn about her new book and everything else she's doing in the world. Um, Nancy, what a beautiful, sacred conversation. My, my heart's fluttering. So thank you, my friend. Thank you so much, Linda. This was absolutely delightful. Until the next episode, ladies, blessings. <laughs>